Good afternoon, everybody. So, um, well, like I said, you can find me on the internet with uh, Luca Maraschi, very simple. So you know my name and my surname. And uh, like Ian said, I spend most of my time uh, digging into post-mortem uh, techniques. So I've been giving actually several talks about uh, the magic dump. That was my uh, beautiful talk. But unfortunately, it was time to change. And I knew that yesterday was microservices day, so I needed to play something against it. Um, so right now, I'm actually busy um, doing something a little bit crazy, uh, porting MDB to Linux together with other folks from Giant. Uh, and together with them, actually, with Dave Pacheco and a guy from uh, uh, Netflix, Yunong, we are trying to actually take whatever is in the core DOM transform it in a common hidden format so that everybody can build his own tool on top of it. But it's not the subject of this talk, unfortunately, because we haven't started yet. So I want to start saying that uh, uh, with a disclaimer. And what I'm going to tell you is just my own opinion. And uh, I do not work for Uber. How many of you know Uber, by the way? OK, great. Today is the day that you know how Uber works. Oops, I hope not to go in jail for that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but I start a little bit. I'm a dreamer, you know. I'm, I'm Italian, I'm crazy, I jump around like a lot of people are telling me. Uh, and I still don't know how to turn off the sound of my iWatch, so um, I'm still Googling. Uh, but I have a dream, actually. That is, uh, I would like, actually, to have this infrastructure that is completely autonomous and it scales dynamically. And autonomous, is it? Um, behind the line, actually, I would like to kill DevOps, but I don't put it on slides because, you know, it puts me in trouble, this thing. Um, <laughs> And I have another passion. So when I was studying at MIT, uh, I spent most of my time actually uh, thinking about how we can, uh, we can basically simplify even for children developing uh, very complex uh, uh, systems, and especially software for robots. Um, so I'm going to tell you just a story. Once upon a time, there was the thing that everybody knows about, the monolith. And it was standing in this way. and. Uh, um, then actually a brilliant technology came across and was Java. And the monolith actually transformed itself from being a huge black monolith to be this one. <laughs> and if you, if, you, if you Google it, if you Google monolith, it's literally one of the first pictures on Google images. <laughs> they tell it's faith. I think it's more destiny. But, um, and you know, that's another picture that I think uh, shows a little bit the monolith. And it's the, Google, the Oracle uh, headquarter. Uh, my enemy number one. And I think something that never really worked out for them was a, a principle that I learned when I studied at the gymnasium, when I studied Latin. It was divide et impera. And it's actually how successful army in the Roman, um, at the Roman time, they succeeded in winning wars, separating and segregating their army in small chunks that could attack on different sides the enemy. And then, you know, everybody knows. How many of you yesterday went to microservices day? Ah, OK. Well, it was a rainy day. Um, <laughs> then microservices came. And uh, you know, microservices, they soon actually became hipsters. <laughs> and uh, um, well, we all know the story. So microservices, you heard the, how they were born, how they should be designed. There's a huge discussion on many lines of code you should put. I always say that if, if you minify them, or if you write everything on one line, you also have a microservice. Um, <laughs> And then actually there was this uh, blog post once. I, I had to do it just because there was the picture of Kian. And, uh, um, and Node.js actually embraced the world of microservices, right? But you know, when, uh, when, when your API, your service, uh, your application, call it as you want, um, basically is successful, success brings also many, many more user to your uh, to your infrastructure. And unfortunately, more user means more compute power needed to run your API. Well, it depends how successful it is. But. And unfortunately, compute power still nowadays means uh, um, more racks, and it increases the distribution, right? You, you create a cluster of machines. Even if they're stateless, they need to kind of communicate with each other. You need to know how they're plotting your entire subnet. And, uh, um, and it adds a lot of complexity. So distribution is complex. How many of you are running distributed system or they design distributed system? OK. Well, 
I don't know how many events or transactions per second you're running, but definitely um, it, it's a pain in the ass because uh, the increased number of transactions is going to basically uh, impact directly, completely also the distribution of your network and of all your services. And then, you know, everybody knows, a company that before was actually great in selling books decided also to sell hardware. Um, and they, they create the cloud, this mystify things that does everything magically. And it was Amazon, by the way. Um, and actually what they tried to sell around was elasticity, right? And they say, we give you the elastic load balancer. How many of you are using the elastic load balancer, by the way? Okay. Sorry. Um, I mean, I, 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 still, I still cannot understand the design behind the elastic load balancer. But if anybody of you has a, an answer for that, except telling me that it's written in Java that I already know, just please explain to me because it's really hard. Yeah, I know, I know, it should balance. And then, you know, you had CloudWatch, you had uh, the auto-scaling group, and you had all these things. And at the end of the day, when you have uh, 3,000 line of cloud formation, you have one service that can scale. <laughs> and then, you know, microservices, and that's, for example, where I, have, uh, where I had a lot of discussion with Brian Cantrell. And uh, um, I leave you actually Google his name and search out the kind of guy that he is. Um, and we spoke about actually Docker and how we embrace the philosophy of microservices and uh, especially how basically if it could solve the problem of interconnecting pieces with each other. Well, how many of you are using Docker, by the way? Just, okay, I hope everybody, yeah, almost. Uh, well, Docker actually does not solve this problem. Actually, only make sure that it, it works on my machine. Now is a real statement that you can do. It works on my machine, then it also works somewhere else. Because, you know, more containers means service discovery. So service discovery is not a problem that is solved by Docker. But one of the problems that I had running uh, uh, microservices and distributed architecture at scale has always been one. The missing of resiliency and fault tolerance. And for somebody who lost post-mortem, this one was basically just my my peanut butter, my, just my Nutella, you know, for an Italian, the Nutella is the best thing ever. Um, I think it's mostly universal statement, but um, the fault tolerance. So in a nutshell, what this thing means that your server will crash. And if your server crash, it means that the job that I'm doing in postmortem is worth something. But you know, business does not really like it. And especially um, this one is actually uh, the design of a company called Vacom. It's an e-commerce website, and they, they run microservices, and they run it at scale. And they have this kind of super uber complex uh, system to just run few services, because what they do, they just aggregate data from third parties. And for me, actually, the biggest problem ever has always been to handle the cluster. So I come from a Microsoft world, where the cluster was actually solved by IIS. I, I know that you don't want to mess with IIS, but live with it. He handled the cluster. He does everything. So you pay a bunch of money, and it does it. Uh, but in Node.js, unfortunately, I mean, the cluster library, everybody knows that does not work across machines. It only work across processes. And it is also, I mean, how many of you are using clusters? OK, Scala is a great system. Don't use cluster. Just work with this tiny, small process, and you will go far away, um, especially the stack. The stack trace is going to mess you up. But um, what, what happened in this distributed architecture is that usually the failure of your cluster is detected by heartbeats. So basically, imagine a ping continues to your machine and say, are you alive? Are you alive? Are you alive? And I remember in my past that I cannot mention, in my past that somebody came up with a brilliant idea. We write a web service. In, we write an endpoint in Nginx, which is going to ask if Node is alive or not. And we ask basically to the different system to basically ping each other in chain. So they don't ping across each other. They just ping in the chain. So one layer after each other, they were pinging as, is this machine alive? <laughs> and you know, the ELB does not offer you multiple level of uh, health checks. So that's why we built a web service that was telling you which service was down. And it was just, OK, it's the past. That's why it's called past. Um, and basically, my life was in the DevOps hell. You know, with things that were crashing and nobody knew how they could keep, be kept alive. Uh, and you know, the, the horrible thing, and if you watch my talk at NodeConf, is that I, 
I don't sleep really a lot, but at 3 a.m. in the night, I would like not to be awake by a phone call of pager duty telling me a machine is down and be awake all night to discover that was just a simple configuration problem. So what my issue was that, and the issue of gener uh, generically of distributed system is that the state of your cluster can uh, change continuously and suddenly. Well, right. And it's a problem. It's a huge problem because if the state, uh, the state of your cluster uh, changes, means that it becomes unreliable. And we want to be resilient. Until actually somebody at uh, Cornell University uh, came out with this white paper. How many of you know about SWIM? That is not SWIM as swimming, but it's SWIM the protocol. Um, it, it, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant white paper. Read it. It's beautiful. It's not so long. And what actually is going to tell you is going to tell you that is a scalable, weakly consistent, infection style membership protocol. It's clear, right? So it solves the problem of distributed system. It's scalable, and we have it. It's weakly consistent because we all know that strong consistency is just something that Oracle sells, and we leave it to them. Um, infection style is beautiful. Imagine, close your eyes and imagine this thing that they're moving all around. They're not actually moving, but imagine it. Um, and it's membership. So basically, it's cooperative. Basically, it's just aggregating every time that you add or remove something. The other thing, they know about it, right? Because they're a member of the same group. I start with weekly consistent. Um, in a distributed system, even banks, they are not strongly consistent. I mean, that's the truth. I work with banks, and um, they're not, they not strong consistent anymore, right? They, they are working with event sourcing. Uh, architecture and they somehow reconcile and build up your balance, which is I know is very scary. That's why my suggestion is keep your balance to zero, so you're sure that they cannot mess it up. <laughs> um, the problem is that, and what Zwim try to solve is basically the failure detection over the cluster, because it's a gossip protocol. Everybody tells to each other its own state. So we are moving from stateless uh, microservices to something that is becoming more stateful in terms of in between your business logic and your infrastructure. Because the nicest thing is that the information is completely spread across your cluster. So imagine that I add a new node, and all the other they know about this node. I just love it. Um, the nicest thing is that you do smart load balancing. So you know your cluster, and you can do extremely smart load balancing um, because um, the, the principle actually uh, is that um, the dissemination of the, the topology can also basically influence what is your um, routing uh, policy. And you will see later in the slide because there's a mathematical algorithm that helps the hell out of it. But especially it's designed for distribute, distribute system, which is the problem that we are trying to solve. And it all sounds so magic. <laughs> And now imagine whatever tool you are using. So I already got a question. How can I react on top of the cluster? Uh, a protocol does not solve this problem, right? It's an architecture that solves the problem of interconnecting all different pieces together and let them have a meaning. What I, what I mean is that um, if your cluster goes on, if 80% if, uh, of your machine, they are heating up uh, and you need to add three extra nodes, it's something that a third party service and orchestration service has to do. Uh, Zwim does not solve this problem. Zwim helps in cooperative, in cooperative clustering. So I add a node to the cluster, but how can I rebalance the entire topology? Because I had a new IP, how the hell can somebody else find that new node? And that's the magic. That, that's the thing that I finally realized while I studied math. That, that was when I finally saw the consistent hashing. Consistent hashing, how many of you know about what a consistent hashing is? How many of you are using DynamoDB? React? OK, well, <clears throat> they're using it, by the way. Which we, we should make you sleep extremely quietly because they, they can basically um, guarantee high availability. So this one is how the hashing works. Imagine, uh, imagine that I had, uh, I had the cluster nodes on this ring, and every cluster node uh, is dedicated to a certain subset of requests. 
and uh, um, they are equally distributed, so it's a ring. And the only thing that it might happen is that they go in uh, that loop, means that uh, they basically uh, reply for word, because every node can reply for word. So if he can satisfy the request, he replies, else he forwards to the next one. And it's a wheel, it continuously spins. So you can go in infinite loop, clearly, but we all know that in every distributed system, you should actually use uh, something called circuit breaking. So use e tricks or whatever else. So, but why and what the uh, consistent uh, hash ring? What is solving? Solving the problem of um, uh, partitioning, uh, and uh, um, partitioning is extremely important because we just spoke about smart load balancing. And how many of you are familiar with sharding technique? Okay, great. Consistent hash ring is just to shard. So you shard basically the workload across this cluster. Um, it makes your elasticity extremely predictable, right? Because you know exactly so that, okay, the limitation of the hash is that it's going to reach a limit and it needs to be a rebalance, right? So if you are Dynamo, DynamoDB does not use, a, um, is a consistent hash ring based on a graph because they want to have infinite scalability. Um, what I'm telling you is just limited to the number of hashes that you can generate. So um, pretty simple, right? Two at the power of 170 in case of a so, uh, pretty normal machine, and that's are your possibility of spreading across your cluster. Nicest thing is the replication, because uh, the consistent hashing is consistent, so it's strongly consistent. But the most interesting part is that the state of the cluster is distributed across the cluster himself. And brings us basically to say that the edges are not stateless, but they are fully stateful. What, the, what, what this thing means is that imagine swim is making the information circulate. And consistent hash ring is a technique of routing and distributing work to these cluster nodes. And is highly dynamic because it can be recalculated. So, but let's go down to earth. And how many of you know this symbol? Is Ashikov Surf is implementing uh, Swim with a couple of tweaks. Um, and I highly recommend not to use it because it's going to bring you to consult. And sorry, but I asked uh, Matteo to give me the white background, but as of now, he have not sent it me yet. So uh, now you see, but it's called Upring. It's a library that we are uh, e initiated and we're working together. And it's basically doing application level sharding, which means that. We, we want to put the responsibility of sharding and uh, routing where the, the request has to be handled inside of the application itself. So imagine that you have this kind of BitTorrent network where a request comes in and we go to a seed to, to answer that particular request. So BitTorrent is a great example of swim plus consistent hash ring, by the way. Well, just with a lot of fantasy, but that's it. But OK, let's go back to our best friend of Uber. Um, uh, Uber wrote three libraries, and these three libraries, they make sense. If you take them separate, they don't make sense. So now I, I try to explain to you how they make sense and how they fit the swim uh, consistent hash ring. So they have ring pop that is uh, basically a scalable, fault-tolerant application layer sharding. So what it does, basically, it orchestrates how the, the request has to be dispatched on a, on a, on a, on a network. Um, and it basically implements distribution on, in an, event, an eventually consistent uh, uh, universe. Because um, if you hear, for example, the talk from uh, um, uh, Daniel Eller or whatever guy work on RingPop, they're going to tell you that for them it's most important to be up and running than to be strongly consistent. They don't care about the state. They are, they are aware that they are going to lose some data, but it's more important to be alive. And this one is actually a little bit to give you an idea of what means application level uh, sharding. It means that a group of users, they make a request to an API. And we, if we segment this user based on their user ID, because I imagine that that's the easiest way to uh, shard uh, a request by user, and we have a cluster with three instances on three different machines, they are all exactly the same. Basically, the application, application level sharding means that my application is going to look for by himself, knows where to basically uh, go to look for the component that can answer that particular request based on a particular key. Because on the consistent hash ring, what is important is the key. The key determines the position of the edge that is going to answer. It's like a time. When I tell you it's 3.30, you know how the arrows are positioned, right? 
It's the same stuff in the consistent hashing. But OK, the biggest problem of microservices is service discovery. And in a cluster, it's even more complex. So they build a library called Hyperbahn, um, which means a very fast road in German. Um, I think, actually, because Bahn should be road and Hyper is just English, so they mix up. But um, <laughs> Um, and it's basically just uh, imagine these large scale microservices um, and they know how to route them. So basically, the HTTP request comes in, uh, it hits Hyperbahn. Hyperbahn is built on top of RingPop, and RingPop goes to find the function, the handler for that particular HTTP request across a cluster that is really humongous. So if you read the documentation, they explain to you what it is, enables to service discovery and routing, blah, 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 in a full torrent way, blah, 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 blah. Important thing. Uh, it avoids, Hyperbahn avoids the uh, consistent hashing to go in an infinite loop. Uh, sorry, the, the consistent hashing implementation to go in an infinite loop. Because if it cannot find any function that can reply, it would go infinite spinning across uh, the network. And they have basically a circuit breaker for that. So check out Hyperbahn. Um, it's, still, it's still one, it's the fourth secret of uh, uh, Fatima. So I don't know how many religious people there are, but this one is one of the things that nobody knows, our secret. And I think we are working towards to, the, um, to open up the secret of how Hyperbahn really works, because nobody knows. Um, but if you have patience enough to read the code and not the documentation, you will figure it out that it's just a routing, uh, uh, a routing system based on top of SWIM. Um, OK, don't ask me why not to use console, because the answer is there. Don't use it. Because he has an agent, and you need, I need to deploy a machine for that. Why? I mean, I just deploy Redis and do the same if I want, or level DB. But uh, um, this one is actually how it looks like. So the HTTP request comes in, it's Hyperbahn, and Hyperbahn goes uh, uh, on through, uh, through ring pop. It goes to get the business logic. And it, goes, it does uh, routing, uh, the hash ring, and the membership. So it basically tells this machine is going to resolve this request. Well, then I'm, I'm ending up to all my statement, and I told you. I, I extremely hate HTTP for internal network communication. So uh, the latency sucks. The package does not make sense sometimes. I mean, I'm not, use, I'm not interested in the user agent. but um, I know that it's a service that is calling another one. Um, so my suggestion is just don't use it for internal network communication. And I, apparently, I'm not crazy. I, I, I was actually going almost. Uh, in a mental hygiene uh, um, institute because I said, I'm crazy. I'm just saying something stupid. Until actually I discovered that Uber can run 20 million events per second um, on their in in entire cluster, clearly, um, thanks to T-Channel. T-Channel, it's a multiplexing protocol based for RPC, uh, based on TCP. And uh, um, when I asked Matt Sweeney, um, I know, arguable, um, what the reason was of this, uh, of this uh, uh, generating a new protocol is because actually what they are interested in a, in a highly distributed system is to rebuild the topology of your request. And they embed inside of the protocol all the tracing part. And it's done with Zipkin. If anybody's interested, if you are, okay, if you are trying to solve request tracking, use Zipkin. It's built by uh, Twitter. And is an insane library. Actually, it's a system for making request tracking across multiple <coughs> protocols. Um, the reason of using RPC is very simple. And we are arriving almost to the end, the moment everybody was waiting for. Because at the end, what we are trying to solve is not actually to, to expose really web services, but is just to run as fast as possible and as scale as possible functions. My HTTP request comes in. Somebody is going to do something with the, the package, and it's going to say, handle it. And that handler is just a function. And it's a function running in a distributed way, in a cooperative way, on a cluster. So it, it kind of brings us back to AWS Lambda that I completely hate um, for a simple reason, uh, because it kills the completely the development workflow. I mean, how many of you are running on Lambda? OK, too many hands. Uh, the, problem, the problem of Lambda is that I cannot freaking run it on my machine. So you give me Docker. 
I can say that what works on my computer works also on that, uh, on the server. But at the same time, you kill me because I cannot test it offline. So that's the thing that I personally actually don't, uh, don't like. But the nicest thing, and is actually what basically I do think actually is the next step for microservices, is to abstract completely that kind of complexity of development. And as a developer, I just want to develop a function, uh, describe this function with a manifest and push it somewhere. That's what Lambda was trying to do. And uh, to be honest, 50% of their idea is brilliant. 50% is a failure in the execution. And you know, we start to say the microservices, they were hipster. And I do think actually, as of today, serverless development is extremely hipster. Um, you know, everybody's into functional development, but actually functional development in terms of you know, a language that expressed himself in function, I was expecting that it was more kind of cooperative computive, uh, computing or something that already WCF for the people that are familiar with .NET already did many, many years ago. Or Akka, for example, tries to do. Um, so I do think actually that the future of how I interpret microservices at scale. And when I say scale, I don't mean scaling on hardware because as you see, there are plenty of implementation is scaling on development and on people. It's actually um, into the hands of distributed function. Um, and what I mean, I mean that um, if, you, if you give a look of what Uber is doing and uh, me and Matteo are doing, um, Surf already did, is actually I think that's the direction of where basically we are trying to build kind of uh, infrastructure unaware and scalability unaware systems that are kind of autonomous. And the development impact lowers to the level of just writing an handler, an input output function. I don't know how far is this future. So I don't know. It depends how much time I can dedicate on writing a library or Uber can make their li library a little bit more usable. But I think that's actually what means swimming in the microservice ocean means is just I think the next step is when we basically think about cooperative microservices and we try to abstract the HTTP part to the purely functional implementation part that are the business logic that we care about. And um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the near future and what Lambda actually is doing and is gonna evolve. So if you are interested, uh, just follow me on Twitter. I don't know when I will be able to post something on uh, the library, but anytime soon and um, if you are interested uh, in anything that is about uh, d uh, tracing all this kind of system, just uh, give me a ping. Else, check Zipkin is insanely brilliant. That was my talk, and I could stay within the time. Good